Hey, good afternoon, folks. My name is Ken. I'm here with Linkso, and we have another exciting presentation by the UC Master Gardeners today um, on IPM, good bugs and bad bugs. Um, and you'll be hearing from Eliana and Sher Sharon today. As always, this class is being recorded, so I will email you a copy of the PDF as well as the uh, link to the recorded class, so you can watch it later if you'd like. Um, and if you have any questions, please do type that in via chat and we'll try to address them towards the end of the talk. Um, other than that, I'm gonna let Eliana and Sharon start the class. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. My name is Eliana Bushwalter and I'm really happy to be here this afternoon uh, with Sharon and just wanted to share just a little bit about myself. I uh, became a UC Master Gardener in 2018, shortly after I retired from um, my career with the county as a registered dietitian. Um, and I love gardens and I love my garden. It's my therapy. It's, it's where I find my peace and I enjoy uh, being out there. Um, and my interest, as you can see here, is, is about bugs. And uh, part of that is a little bit through osmosis as I've, um, I'm the daughter of an entomologist and um, so grew up with bugs. And in fact, I um, had uh, praying mantises as pets that my dad okay. would bring home from okay. the fields when he'd go out when he worked with the uh, stone fruit farmers in the Central Valley. So I became really accustomed to having bugs in my life. And so I, I really enjoy that part of, of uh being a master gardener. So Sharon, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, I'm Sharon Winnicky, and I've been a master gardener since um, 2010. And um, I was a hobby gardener, um, just joined master gardeners because you know I like pretty flowers. But then as get, be, getting introduced to so much subject matter, um, I became more interested in composting, soils, and integrated pest management. Um, I've taken some uh, continuing education classes in uh, IPM, integrated pest management. Um, I train the trainer classes and have taught some classes to fellow master gardeners um, as well. And um, while I'm by no means an expert, um, it, it does seem integrated pest management, which includes um, pest and, and natural enemy uh, controls seems to be kind of at the heart of a lot of gardening. It touches so many things, whether you care about vegetables, or you're interested in ornamentals, uh, composting, um, it's a, a really important part of uh, gardening and what master gardeners do. Um, so with that, um, I'd just like to tell you very briefly about master gardeners. Uh, Eliana and I are uh, both uh, part of the San Mateo and San Francisco County Master Gardener Program. And the basic goal of Master Gardeners, we're, we're volunteers who want to teach, educate, and spread UC, University of California, research-based gardening information to our communities. We do a lot of classes like this on Zoom. Uh, we used to be able to do uh, more in-person demonstration, uh, and we hope that that is coming back. But in addition, a really important thing that we do is uh, hold helplines. So if you have questions, particular questions about your garden, we, you can email, you can call Master Gardener Helpline, and our volunteers will research and we'll get back to you with some solutions. So you'll be getting this slide with this information that will be handy for you. Um, and I hope you take advantage of it. Um, and uh, that we have about 180 master gardeners and we all know a little bit or a lot about a little bit and uh, can hope to uh, be of service to you. So Eliana, back to you and, and we can start with the nuts and bolts of our talk today. Hey. All right, so in this session, we're hoping that you'll have an opportunity to learn a little bit about the beneficial insects and the good bugs and the bad bugs or that, um, that are part of this world. Um, 
of course, the bad bugs are the ones that we don't like, but the good bugs like them. So we're going to talk a little bit about that interaction. Uh, we're also going to uh, provide you with a meaning for integrated pest management, which is uh, 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 the acronym is IPM, and also the meaning of biological control and what that's about. And then also we hope to uh, provide with provide you with a few garden tactics that will encourage uh, beneficial bugs to stay in your edible gardens um, and provide you some resources. We're gonna start with the bad bugs and um, there are lots of them. Um, we're gonna highlight what we consider are the most common and certainly not the most exhaustive list. Um, so we're gonna start out with um, probably one of the most, uh, the biggest groups, and that is aphids. All right, so aphids are probably uh, considered one of the most common pests, and there are so many, many species of, um, of aphids, and I'm sure that most of you know what these little guys look like. They come in all sorts of colors. Um, the young uh, or the nymphs are just smaller versions of their uh, parents or the adults. Um, they're generally a wingless insect and they're found in such dense groups. I know that in my garden, they tend to love um, my young rose um, buds. And so I can, I can find them um, all over and, and know what they look like. They are, um, they can be found also on leaves and stems and uh, all around, and they don't move very uh, quickly. So that of course makes them easier to deal with in terms of um, uh, trying to um, control them. They affect a lot of um, edibles and ornamental plants, um, including squashes and beans and artichokes, leafy greens, cucumbers and citrus plants. And they do leave um, uh, some, some stunted growth and they, and they also cause sooty mold fungus and can tra transmit uh, viruses from one plant to another. So they are uh, one of the pests that you really want to try and control. The one thing about aphids is, is that they seldom will kill mature plants. Um, they produce a honeydew um, that is part of the cause of the sooty mold fungus. And that honeydew um, that they produce also promotes ants. Um, so that's one of the, the problematic issues of not only would you have aphids, but now you've got ants as well. But the honeydew can attract beneficial. So there's kind of this, this good bad bug kind of situation. Um, the, the best way to uh, deal with them is to knock them off with a water stream and that's what I do. And I also remove them by hand. I, I just might get my gloved hand and start taking them off of the plants. Um, I do check my garden really regularly uh, to look for them so that I can get them when um, the, the populations aren't very high. So management and control, um, as I mentioned, uh, ants really uh, will protect. If they find uh, a, a cluster of aphids that are producing the honeydew that they like, they will uh, do their best to protect those ants. So uh, one of the ways that you can control ants and then as a result control the aphids is uh, to use a sticky material uh, on trunks of of the plants and trees. Uh, there's one brand called Tanglefoot that you can use. Insecticidal soap is something you can use too, but we always just say last resort. Um, use insecticidal soap sparingly and focus on the removal of the aphids on the affected plant itself that you are um, trying to uh, control. So then we talked about ants and, and they are related to bees and wasps. Uh, they go through a metamorphosis so that the uh, larvae are, are worms and they don't look like they're the adults. 
They are real social insects, as you know, they live in really, really dense colonies and they establish queens that then lay the eggs that become the adult workers that go all over our garden and wreak havoc. They feed on sugar, sweets and fats and meats and so th that's why they're attracted to that honeydew. And the honeydew isn't just produced by aphids, mealybugs, soft scales, um, white flies also produce this honeydew. So um, the, the ants will go after those areas where they know the, um, the honeydew is being produced. They will protect these pests from natural enemies and they'll do it really uh, seriously. So as I mentioned before, one way to control um, is to use a tangle foot on the trunks of plants and also to do your best to eliminate the food sources and obviously um, including aphids and other uh, pests that will produce the honeydew. We have, uh, we have added here a, um, a video and a, a link to a video that you can see how uh, Tangle, Tanglefoot works and how the ants and aphids um, work together um, and how the ants protect those, uh, those aphids. And um, when you get a, a, a copy of this after the presentation, you'll be able to um, go to that uh, video and check it out. Slugs and snails. Uh, slugs and snails are not uh, considered insects and they're not considered bugs, but they are among the most destructive pests found in the garden. So we decided that it's important to talk about them here. They are considered mollusks. Um, they're similar in structure except for one has the shell and one doesn't. And they all lay eggs after mating. Uh, the snails take uh, two years to produce um, a mature snail and the slugs only after six months. They frequent damp conditions. And I don't know if uh, how many of you are from North County where we've had such cold um, and foggy mornings. And normally by this time of the, the summer, snails are gone, but I've been finding snails all over the place in my garden and they're, they're going after my uh, zucchini. So they are out there and they're most active at night. So you'll see their trails, um, their slimy trails the next day. They damage a variety of plants. And as I mentioned, um, they will go after herbaceous plants and ripening fruit. And my zucchini is having a hard time out there defending itself against these um, uh, pests. It's best to use a couple of different co uh, combination of, of methods to manage and control them. Um, I physically remove the snails by hand and crush them, get rid of them. I also clean the areas uh, where there's debris and where they can hide. And we've also added a link here that you can access later uh, to see whether or not what damage you're seeing in your garden is snails or whether it's something else. White flies. These tiny little guys are uh, related to aphids and scales and mealybugs are not really true flies. They're little tiny guys. Um, they have uh, little white wings, but they're yellowish bodies and they're, they lay their eggs on the un underside of the leaves. Um, the eggs hatch the young flies and so the young flies look very much like their adults. And the damage that they do is that they have sucking mouth parts. And so they um, go after the plant juices. And as they're doing that, they'll excre excre excrete that honeydew that I mentioned. Um, they will go after a wide variety of edible plants, including uh, fruit trees and citrus and most of the vegetables. And um, so need to check your garden frequently for these um, little pests and look on the undersides of the leaves. These 
white flies do have several natural enemies, uh, including lacewings, big eyed bugs, pirate bugs, and some lady beetles. And Sharon can share a little bit more about those um, natural enemies with you later. Uh, the best way to deal with larger infestations is to remove any infested plants that you noticed or plant material from the garden. Earwigs. I know I've got lots of them near my artichoke plants and uh, they're, they're uh, very identifiable uh, little critters with pincers at their tail ends that they use for defense. And the adults and the immatures both look alike. And the females lay eggs in the soil and they're, these, these guys are active in our gardens all year long. They attack a lot of soft fruit, uh, the corn silk, the flowers, um, and they chew holes on leaves. Um, they're real moisture loving. So you may want to think about um, how you're irrigating your gardens and they thrive in very, very wet conditions. And so you may want to uh, consider adjusting the moisture and also eliminating hiding places where they might be. They can be beneficial though. Um, they will eat aphids. So here's another good bug, bad bug kind of uh, situation that um, you may be um, challenged with. The tomato hornworm. Um, these guys are, are real um, camouflagers. Um, they have a horn-like growth on the end of their uh, body and they develop into night flying moths. They're pretty large, but they can hide really, really well. Um, you might see an awful lot of damage and droppings before you actually uh, identify this critter in your garden. They do a, a lot of damage uh, to leaf stems and fruits and they're voracious eaters of tomato plants. Um, the, the, Best way um, I've found uh, to manage them if I find a lot of them is to hand pick them. And um, lucky for me, I have a, um, a uh, bearded lizard, uh, bearded dragon lizard um, that we care for. And they love these tomato hornworms. So if I find one, I always give um, our spike a treat. Um, and they, these guys are, um, very expensive at the Petco. They're like five or six bucks a pop uh, for one um, little one, little hornworm. So um, I always get very excited when I find one and at the same time a little upset. So the other way is to use uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, which can come as a spray. And Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria that uh, will attack um, the, uh, the system of the um, hornworm. Lady beetles, lacewings, and wasps will eat the eggs. So if you find those in your garden, um, feel lucky for yourself. Cutworms. Cutworms, there are several species. Uh, they produce uh, caterpillars that feed at night. Um, they are uh, brown and black moss. And so the, the caterpillar is the immature uh, version of these moss. They roll into these tight seas, as you can see on, in the picture here. They will chew right through the stems of young seedlings. And I had uh, a challenge with my young seedling uh, squashes earlier this year uh, because of them. And the best way to protect the, your young seedlings is to take like an uh, empty uh, toilet paper roll or a paper towel roll and to bury it. Uh, and put it around your seedlings to protect them. And BT spray uh, will, can also help in this situation. Spittle bugs. Um, as you can see here, these little guys, you, I've, you've probably seen them. They, they hang out in my garden on the rosemary bushes uh, in the early spring. They're the nymph of a frog hopper insect. And they, they they secrete the spittle so that they can hide from predators. That's, that's the whole process there. And the damage they do is not really, really serious, but they can distort leaves. 
So I take a hose and I spray them off. And usually by summertime, um, it, within a month of them appearing, they usually go away. Leaf miners. So leaf miners are the larvae of a very small fly. And in the first picture there is this fly and, and they're so tiny that sometimes you can't really see them very well. But you'll see the effect of the, the leaf miners, the worms themselves, that feed between the leaf surfaces um, and they create a mine. Um, the, the, the fly lays the eggs and they go in through the leaves and cause all of these little tracks. They can cover leaves um, and they leave behind the mines and then once they uh, come out of the leaf, they drop to the ground so they can develop. But in the meantime, they leave all this um, awfulness behind. So the damage they do, uh, they will affect uh, ornamentals and vegetables alike. Um, the mining actually has very little impact on the on the plant growth, and it rarely kills um, the. Um, the plant, but heavy damage uh, can cause the plant to, to slow its growth down. Uh, the, best play, the, the best way to manage and control um, the plant care here is to uh, make sure that the plants are vigorous and healthy. Uh, plant resistant varieties of these plants um, that you may have um, and Small seedlings can be protected with row uh, covers if, if you need to. Make sure to remove all the older infested leaves. Um, and usually leaf miners can be kept under control by natural parasites, uh, as Sharon will share. Um, and insecticides are really not effective here, especially since these guys are burrowing themselves in the middle of leaves. Um, that's it's not something that happens very easily. So those are some of the bad bugs. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sharon to talk about the good ones. Sharon. Are you there? You may be muted, not sure. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> I was trying to find my unmute button here. Um, can you hear me now? You can, okay, great. Um, so I have the, uh, the fun job of talking about the good guys um, after Eliana um, got to tell you a little bit of the bad news, but there are a lot of good guys in the garden. And I think um, instinctively as gardeners, you see bugs, at least that's how I, how I started gardening. And you make an assumption that they're you know, a problem. Well, in fact, only about 1% of all insects and mites are harmful to plants. And there are far more beneficials in your garden than there are uh, bad bugs. Um, actually, most of the insects in your garden are probably just neutral. So we're gonna talk about three different um, bugs that are beneficial, the three Ps here, predators, parasitoids, and pollinators. Now, very briefly, Predators are insects that eat other pests, other, well, I should say other insects and mites who are, who could be pests. Parasitoids uh, include a number of species of wasps and flies, um, and they lay their eggs in or uh, on the host insect, and then the, ju the juveniles consume the host insect. And finally, pollinators are uh, beneficials because they uh, fertilize plants and they are critical in producing fruits and seeds. Before we get started, we thought you all might enjoy uh, seeing a little bit of a video of some of the predators we're gonna talk about in more detail and the parasitoids 
who are aphid eaters. And seeing them in action uh, can be really fascinating. Do you have lots of aphids in your garden? If you do, look very closely and you may also find beneficial insects feeding on them. Lady beetles are voracious aphid feeders. Most people recognize adult lady beetles, but lady beetle larvae, which are unfamiliar to many people, also stalk and eat aphids. These tiny black lady beetles just hatched out of their eggs. They'll soon be off to hunt aphids. Another common aphid predator is the green lacewing. Adults have lacy green wings and golden eyes. They lay eggs on long stalks, either singly or in clusters. Lacewing larvae are the primary predatory stage. Larvae are alligator-like insects that grab aphids with their pincher-like mandibles and suck out the aphids' contents. In addition to aphids, lacewings feed on many other small soft-bodied insects, such as scales, caterpillars, and psyllids. Surfid flies, sometimes called flower flies or hoverflies, feed on pollen and nectar. However, surfid fly larvae feed almost entirely on aphids. These pale, legless, caterpillar-like maggots are often found wandering in aphid colonies, seizing aphids and scarfing them up as they go. Many other predators also feed on aphids. Soldier beetles are very common aphid predators on flowering plants. Damselbugs feed on aphids, as well as many other small to medium-sized insects. Predaceous midges are very small maggots similar to surfids that can often be found feeding on aphids. In addition to these aphid predators or hunters, many tiny wasps kill and parasitize aphids by laying their eggs inside the aphid's body. Eggs hatch into wasp larvae that feed within the aphid and rapidly kill it. The dead aphid develops a beige or black crust called a mummy and the wasp pupates within, cutting a circular hole when it is ready to emerge as an adult wasp. Parasitic wasps and aphid predators frequently keep aphid populations at low levels, protect these natural enemies by avoiding sprays and insecticides that will kill them. See the UC IPM website for more information on aphids and natural enemies. Do you have lots oh. of aphids in your uh -huh. garden? If you do look very sorry about that. Let's see if we're gonna zip past there. No. Do you have lots of there we go. There we go. As much fun as that was to watch, I didn't want to really replay it that many times. Um so I'm sure um if you're like me, um you kind of get you get a little bit of enjoyment out of seeing aphids being taken care of um, by our lovely, lovely uh, poster child for, for uh, good bugs, the, uh, the, lady, the lady beetle. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the predator category of our beneficial um, insects at this point. Um, as the, the, as you, the um, uh, video showed you, they prey and feed on a variety of pests, not just the aphids. They're naturally helpful, but alone they are not going to uh, control pests because you have to have a certain amount of food available for them in your, in your garden in order for them to hang around. Um, so they chew their prey with the mandibles or they pierce them like um, the example below here, you can see a assassin bug that has a piercing tube-like mouth part uh, piercing its uh, prey. Um, and the species include uh, the lace wings that you saw, various predatory bugs, um, the wide variety of wasps, um, almost all spiders. Now, in the category of lady beetles, um, some are specialized predators and some are generalists. I think mo the ones we see mostly are the convergent lady beetle, and that's the one that is red with the uh, red with uh, black dots, um, although there are others also colored that way. And they don't just feed on aphids, but also mealybugs, spider mites, and scales and others. Now they migrate from the Sierras uh, uh, to the valley and the coast in the spring in our area. And the below picture um, shows them in uh, Pinnacles National Park overwintering. There's a little bit of an issue um, 
about uh, uh, diminishing populations of lady beetles. Um, you might have seen that lady beetles are available uh, for sale in some garden stores and hardware stores. Um, well, uh, they aren't propagated, uh, you know, in a, in a greenhouse or in a nursery somewhere. Um, they're gathered out in the mountain areas. Um, and so that is uh, diminishing their natural population. So that's something to be conscious of when you're um, choosing, if you're choosing to purchase lady beetles as part of a natural control. And we can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, lady beetles uh, come in a variety of, uh, of um, species. And this uh, slide I think is kind of interesting because it uh, not only shows those specialized predators, those specialized ladybugs, but it also shows you the uh, differences that lady beetles have in their coloration. The mealy bug destroyer um, up on the left-hand side is black without any spots. Similarly, the spider mite destroyer is all black. And then twice stabbed um, it has kind of the reverse coloration of with red dots on a black body uh, that we generally see. And then um, again, the, the dahlia um, over to the bottom right, um, you can see that the number of spots isn't really uniform in that, in that species. And you've seen that alligator um, aphid on the film. Um, I have rarely seen one of these in my garden. They're small and I'd have to be really observant. But if you do see something, this alligator-like larvae, he's a great worker for you in the garden. This is not one that you wanna brush off or uh, squish. And other uh, beetle species are also predators. Uh, the predaceous ground beetle is um, a pretty large beetle. And I do see that one in the garden. I see that um, the, the uh, predaceous ground beetle in um, the soil under and in litter, leaf litter and the like. And the great thing that uh, he'll do for our gardens is um, attack snails, uh, slug snail eggs, and uh, also breaks down organic matter. Um, and then the um, attractive soldier beetle. I think he's a handsome fellow with his uh, red and black coloration is one that's easily seen. It's a larger beetle in your garden. I see um, him often well in, in the soil, but also on roses because they um, also eat pollen. Um, so this is not one that you should uh, want to get rid of from your garden. One you, you want to encourage to stay who eats the eggs of uh, of uh, beetles and moths and uh, is a great helper. Um, the lacewing uh, larvae. I thought the uh, video did a nice job in showing you uh, the lacewing, but not only aphids um, do the, does the larva eat, also mites, scales, thrips, white flies, and insect eggs. Only a few of the species of the lacewing um, adult are predators but all of the larvae are predators. So if you see lace wings uh, in, the, in the yard, um, that's a very good thing. Um, they are attracted to light and, um, jumped ahead here. Um, they're attracted to light. So if you haven't seen them, you might, uh, and they fly at night. So you might see them below your lights in the morning if some of them have died there um, over the light, if you wanna identify whether you have them in your garden. Um, the surfeit fly um, is usually pretty visible uh, in your garden. Uh, a lot of people confuse it for obvious reasons with the honeybee because of its coloration. It is a fly though, not a bee. And its flight pattern does kind of helicopter hovering over the flowers and that's how it gets its name. Now the adult is not a, um, is uh, not a predator. Um, it's a pollinator, but its larva is uh, the, uh, as the, I think the video pointed out, is the uh, predator. And you can distinguish it from a caterpillar because of that point is the lower picture, you can see a picture of that green larva. Um, it has a pointy mouth part and um, a caterpillar would have a chewing mouth part. And also it's legless 
and its uh, body is fairly transparent. You can see internal organs through it. Next category of predatory uh, insects are true bugs. True bugs are a really big category of bugs. There's probably 50 to 80,000 different kinds of true bugs. Um, you can tell a true bug by the fact that it's, um, it's got an X on its back. Its wings fold over its outer wings in the shape of an X. Um, but in that true bug category, there's only about five that are actually good bugs the rep for, for us, or at least they're predatory bugs. The rest are plant eaters. They're probably neutral or in some cases harmful. The assassin bug on the top there is um, a fairly good sized bug, uh, not huge, but it's, it's one that you can see with your, your own eyes. And it um, attacks its prey by, uh, by paralyzing them and using that piercing mouth part uh, to paralyze them. Um, uh, by the way, some of them, some species can be irritating if they bite people in the assassin bug. So this is not one that you want the, your little kids to be playing with, even though we consider him a, a friend of ours. Um, the next uh, photo is a photo of the big eyed bug named because it's got those big eyes on either side of its face. Um, it eats eggs, especially caterpillar eggs, which is a great thing, and um, small caterpillars, flea beetles, and mites. Next, uh, the damsel bug was also pictured in the video. Um, the damsel bug, I think, got its name because its uh, markings on its uh, tail end are kind of got little ruffles, like ruffle-like. Uh, uh, markings and it reminds people, I guess it reminded some people of a skirt and so they named it the damsel bug. But it's a, a, a good bug to uh, have in the garden feeding on a wide variety of tree crops, row crops as well. And then the minute pirate bug um, is, as its name suggests, is really tiny. Um, you probably have a hard time seeing that. In this picture it's feeding on a scale and the scales are really very small and it's not you know, it's bigger than a scale, but it's not huge. So it preys on eggs, tiny insects and mites, uh, especially thrips. And here, um, the final true bug that we're gonna talk about is the spiny or soldier stink bug. The picture of the stink bug, the one that says good, um, you can see that there's these spikes on its shoulders and of all the stink bugs, it's our only good predator. The brown marmorated um, stink bug is pictured to the right. Uh, that is an invasive species that has really wreaked havoc in the eastern and some of the southern part of the United States. We're fortunate that it is not a big pest here yet, although they're monitoring this situation. Uh, the marmorated stink bug has been found in California, but it's probably come in you know, in the luggage of somebody from, um, from out of state from the east and it hasn't established like re reproductive colonies yet, but there is concern about that and uh, the UC scientists are keeping their eye on it. So this good guy is here, um, the predatory true bug. And so if you see him in the garden, again, uh, uh, keep that one around, don't squish him. He eats small insects and insect eggs. And then spiders. I know a lot of people are afraid of spiders. It kind of give them, they give them the creeps a little bit, uh, but it's good to know that almost any spider that you see in your garden is a predator and it's not harmful to humans. There's only about three spiders in all of California that could cause any harm um, to humans. You know, the black widow spider, the recluse spider, but they're going to be hiding in debris and in dark places, like in dark corners of your garage, they're not going to be out in the garden and they're not gonna attack people. So um, while well, spiders, again, they're not insects because they have eight legs and two body parts, we thought they were important to add to our, um, to our uh, presentation because they're, they're plentiful and they're um, in your garden and a healthy garden will have a healthy 
amount of spiders. The next category we're gonna talk about are parasitoids. So what is a parasitoid? A parasitoid's juvenile, juveniles will develop inside its host. So they're made up of a wide variety of wasps and flies um, that uh, tend to do this. You can see, you saw in the video, the aphids, the, uh, the uh, wasp that was uh, uh, laying eggs inside the aphid to develop, but they'll also lay eggs on caterpillars, leafhoppers, mealybugs, scales, white flies. Um, and they, uh, they uh, consume the host and the host always dies uh, by the time the, the uh, uh, larva ha has completed um, its, its time inside the, the host. So the wasps are known stinging. A lot of them are so small, you won't see them with the naked eye, uh, but you might see that mummy in your garden. And that's evidence that you have the wasps in your garden. Tachinid flies are one of the kind of flies that are, uh, are uh, parasitoids. Uh, picture the kind of flies in the middle there. It looks a lot like a house fly, except it has a lot of bristles. You can certainly see it in your garden with your naked eye. Um, various species of tachinid flies will either lay eggs on its prey, like gluing them to them and attaching them. And then when the egg hatches, the, the uh, larva, or I guess in this case, it's a fly, a maggot, the maggot burrows into the host and then they exit when they um, are pupating. And the very bottom is a picture of a cabbage looper and those dark spots are the exit holes that the uh, young have, have uh, uh, retreated from. The final category we have are the pollinators uh, that are so essential for um, our vegetable and fruit production. Uh, some vegetables and fruits absolutely require pollination in order to get um, a yield. That would be broccoli, squash, blueberries, many more, many tree fruits. Um, but even in cases where, you're, well, where you will get a crop uh, in the absence of pollination, sometimes that crop will be weak. Um, the quality will be reduced if it's not pollinated. The quantity will be diminished. Um, the straw picture of the strawberries is an example there. And then Again, some, sometimes uh, pollinators are essential because their young are predators, like our example of the surfeit fly. And so you've got to provide that uh, pollination and that uh, food for the pollinator in order to get the beneficial uh, young. Here's a nice picture of uh, one of our favorite uh, pollinators, one of our uh, favorite uh, uh, favorites of the garden, um, Eliana took this picture uh, of the uh, caterpillar. And uh, Eliana, you wanna tell us about uh, your experience with caterpillars in the garden? So I found this guy on my parsley and um, I had no idea what it was. And I went to identify it uh, after I had seen that lots of my parsley was being munched off. I had this big, big area of parsley and this whole little area with no leaves. And then I found this little guy. And as it turns out, it's a swallowtail caterpillar. Um, so it turns into this beautiful pollinator. And I thought to myself, well, I guess I've got enough parsley that I can share some. So even though this caterpillar is munching on my crop, um, I know that the, the benefit of having the pollinator in my garden far outweighs the amount of uh, parsley this guy can eat. So I, I said, okay, I'll share my, my parsley with, with the caterpillars so that the swallowtails can survive. I think that's yeah. an example where we, we would love to categorize things cleanly as good bug, bad bug, but there are a lot of times where at one life cycle, a bug could be a pest and at a different life cycle, it could be, um, it could be a beneficial in your garden. So perhaps a little tolerance is something that we need to think about in our gardens. 
again, an, another nice picture by Eliana. Uh, they look to me like wasps uh, pollen, um, in the garden, Eliana, um, rather than bees, but I'm, I'm not were, sure. I think they're bees. Are, are they bees? I think they were bees, yeah. Okay. And you know, keep in mind, um, there are a lot of native bees, quite a variety. And you think of the honeybee mostly, but um, that's just a small percentage of the bees that are in our, in our gardens. Um, and the honeybee isn't a native, it's, it's from Europe, um, but only the honeybee and bumblebees in North America build, build hives and live in colonies. So they're probably more identifiable because there's just a, a larger cluster of them um, in one place. But most of them, most bees that you see in your garden will be solitary in various sizes and shapes. And of course, we want to give a little shout out to the monarch uh, butterfly. I'm sure most of you know from a lot of news reports that they are endangered and their numbers are decreasing um, due to climate change and um, perhaps a loss of habitat. Um, so uh, a, a one that you want to preserve if you see in your garden. Planting some native milkweed would be a nice way to hopefully attract them and uh, feed them in your garden. The caterpillar you see up on top there, uh, the monarch caterpillar is um, chomping away at, a, at uh, looks like milkweed. And um, there is, it's hard to see, but the very bottom picture on the right is a, a picture of the chrysalis of that uh, of that caterpillar. Again, we've talked about that, the surfed fly or hover, hover fly um, being a pollinator and other wasps and bees, but also uh, beetles, moths, other insects in the garden are, are effective pollinators. And if you plant a variety of plants in the garden, this is gonna attract a variety of pollinators. So, so what are some garden tactics that you can use to encourage uh, beneficials? Certainly uh, creating a pollinator habitat and a butterfly garden are, is really key. Uh, planting a variety of plants, uh, making sure that you have lots of different types of plants in your garden. Reducing the weeds and the dead infected plants um, and also tolerating some bad bugs so that the good ones stay. Uh, you want to try your best to keep ants out of infested plants and try to use non-chemical methods to control first. You want to invite good guys into your garden um, and certainly keep in mind that some pests overwinter in debris so keeping your your garden clean of debris is really really important. Uh, plant some annuals with your vegetables, um, especially open flowers. Um, the, the, the concept being that open flowers allow pollinators and, um, and uh, especially uh, bees and hoverflies to uh, be attracted to the pollen that's inside the flower. Um, hybrid, some hybrid flowers I've read um, that have multiple petals that look like they're all closed in because they're hybrids of a particular flower tend to hide the stamen and the pollen so that the, 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 the pollinator has difficulty getting in. So it's best to try and, and stick with your, your, your basic flowers, poppies, sunflowers. I have lots of salvias in my garden um, and thyme and rosemary and ceanothus things that are native to the area that, that will attract your uh, that lots of pollinators. I've found that just in the last five years as I've planted lots of uh, 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 native plants, especially salvias, um, that I've gotten an awful lot of different kinds, just like Sharon mentioned, lots of different kinds of bees and hoverflies, not just the honeybees and the bumblebees. There's, there's just the variety, it's been fun to watch. Plant an herb garden. Um, an herb garden uh, attracts the the good good bugs, and um, you know it, it attracts the beneficials. And then also, uh, so I suggest that you allow some of your herbs and your veg veggies to go to flower, and these will encourage some of the pollinators. Allow some of your broccoli to go to flower. 
allow some of your um, herbs to go to flower and that will certainly increase their, the beneficials in your garden. You know, uh, Eliana, if I can jump in here. Sure. Too. I know um, people have asked about um, plants that repel uh, pests, mm. if, if there, mm. you know, if, if there's such a thing and what we know about it. Well, it, you can find um, a lot of lists about uh, plants that do have repellent properties uh, to various insects and charts. The trouble is, from my understanding, is there, they, they know certain fragrances, certain oils um, can repel, but there hasn't been enough research done mm -hmm. to really make it practical for people to know what are the quantity of the plants? What does the distance uh, that these plants need to be from uh, the plant you're trying to protect to actually have an effect? So that's uh, something that there might be more research coming up on in the future. Um, meanwhile, you know, if you want to plant uh, your companion plant with uh, uh, your edibles, some of these repellent plants, which some of them are actually also attractive plants to certain insects. So uh, you can do that, but it's it, as a, a management tool, it's probably not really practical at this point. Mm -hmm. Good point. Again, allow some of your, your goodies to go to flower and they're beautiful flowers too. Sage has gorgeous flowers um, and the broccoli does too. Sharon. Oh, back to me. So yeah, IPM, integrated pest management is a huge topic and we're only going to just briefly touch on it because we're, we're really focusing on one little piece of IPM, but it's probably good to, to just give a over a, a broad look at the concept. So um, we're going to talk about the definition of integrated pest management. What are the basic strategies of integrated pest management? Pardon me, management and um, uh, definition of biological control. So here we go. Uh, an ecosystem-based strategy focused on long-term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques. And this graphic, I think it's kind of handy as a little bit of a decision tree um, when you address problems in your garden. At the bottom of the pyramid is where we should all start. Uh, it moves up through non-chemical ways of uh, addressing pests in the, uh, in the garden, biological being toward the top here, what we're talking about today. And the top of the pyramid, tiny, is the last resort of chemical uh, or as we call it, pesticide management. Now, IPM asks the gardener really to make informed decisions about what techniques to use, what's really necessary, what's effective, and what's least negatively um, impactful to the environment. So I think for our, uh, all of us, the gold standard is uh, prevention. If we can prevent problems, uh, it's a heck of a lot less work and less expense and greater um, success. Think about resistant cultivars and then removing infested and dead plants where pests might be hiding. Uh, the really importantly is having healthy, strong plants because resistance plants um, and healthy plants are less susceptible <laughs> to pests. You give, them, give your plant the right conditions, the right humidity, temperature, and light, you're halfway home to, um, having to use fewer uh, interventions. And when you do have problems, uh, begin with thinking about cultural, mechanical, or environmental things that you can do to improve the situation. Uh, crop rotation is planting a different crop in the same spot at the, at the next season. If there's overwintering pests, or in this case, it could be uh, funguses and other things in your soil uh, that attack a particular type of crop, putting a different um, plant in that location um, will not give that an opportunity to uh, really persist. 
um, garden diversification. Uh, Eliana's talked about the paper collar, uh, collars, mesh covers, sticky barriers that are not gonna impact the environment negatively. And then what we've been talking about mostly today is the use of natural enemies to reduce damage caused by pests, and that's biological control. But being realistic, we, we know that biological control is not going to wipe out the pest species. In fact, it, it can't because it needs them as food to stay in your garden. So um, sometimes we need to, you know, think about how much we can tolerate. Uh, do we, can we tolerate some level of damage um, in order to maintain the beneficials? You know, what are, what are our tolerances and our goals? And in, in thinking about that, um, we thought it would be interesting to share uh, this information from Purdue University. Um, especially if you're, you're a new gardener, you might consider selecting um, some of the, the uh, vegetables that never or rarely have uh, damage. And that will cause you a lot less work and a lot less need to um, use uh, um, insecticides. Also, it, it can set your expectations a little bit. If you look over at the column, where usually or always these vegetables and edibles have problems, um, how much can you tolerate? Uh, will you decide to uh, plant a few more tomatoes because some of them aren't going to um, aren't going to be successful? But uh, is is there a little bit more that you can plant, and then you don't have to use uh, pesticides or a chemical uh, means to uh, control the pests? So, Eliana, you want to talk about uh, the times when you do decide that the Problem so persistent, you have to intervene in, in, um, in a chemical way in your garden? So chemical control. Um, part of the IPM definition is that pesticides would only be used when you monitor your garden and, you're, and you've seen that um, there, there's a need according to the established guidelines of IPM. You've done everything else. Um, you've, you've gotten to the point where you need to do chemical control. The treatment needs to be with the goal of only removing the target organism. And you want to uh, select uh, pest control materials and apply them in such a way that it minimizes the risk to human health um, uh, beneficial and non-target organisms and the environments. Um, keep in mind that uh, broad spectrum chemicals uh, will, will uh, can kill beneficials, um, the natural enemies. Um, and there are many broad spectrum uh, chemicals out there. So uh, you want to make sure that uh, you don't use them in such a way that you are in a position of having resistance that can be developed um, and then cause super pests um, or resurgence. And we wanna make sure that the residue doesn't um, get into food, water, uh, food and water supplies. So we wanna use the least toxic method uh, when your non-chemical methods fail to control we recommend if you're going to use chemical um, pesticides to use horticultural sprays, um, uh, oils and insecticidal soaps. These are that are least harmful to people, pets and the surrounding environments. These are still considered chemical pesticides. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, they might be less toxic, but they can still harm a plant. So you need to be sure to follow directions and use the insecticides only as directed on the label. And you, want to make sure, you want to make sure to read um, and follow directions, wear protective gear, eye protection, gloves. Um, and, and keep in mind too, if you find something that says organic, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be safe per se. So really read instructions. We can't emphasize this more um, than to be sure that you uh, follow the directions on the label. 
So humans are direct competitors um, with garden pests for the same food source. Um, and if you think of that in that way, um, how much damage uh, from pests are you willing to tolerate in your garden? Are you willing to tolerate none, some, or a lot? And depending on your answer, the time that you spend controlling pests will be inversely related to your tolerance. So in other words, you need to have a few bad bugs to make sure the good bugs stay in your garden. Sharon. Yeah. Um, we, of course, um, as you see, master gardeners, um, are, are really fans of the website resources that are provided by the UC ANR. Um, and we've got a big list of, of resources for you. Um, but we thought it might be fun to take a look at a diagnostic tool that's right on the website. Uh, we'll take you, I'll link, click this link and take you to it. Um, here's the UC IPM website. And I'm going to go down here. Uh, on the right to plant problem diagnostic tool. We're not seeing your screen, Sharon. Uh oh, sharing is paused. Okay, bring your screen to the front. I wonder how that happened. Darn, we haven't done that before. Okay. Let me see. Hmm. Hmm. Did you not see? You didn't even see the uh, UC site. I no, we're it. we're still we're still seeing the presentation at this point, Sharon. Mm -hmm. We added this. I Sharon, you can just switch between the screens between the presentation here and your other browser. Okay. Get my now I've lost the presentation, but I can get it back very quickly. Let's see, get that back. Okay, here we go. Okay. Now I'm going to click this. Here we go. Let's see if this all we see is a blank screen. Okay. Um my, oh, all right, home page at PM. You're not seeing anything, are you? I'm moving through. Yeah. I'm, on my browser, I'm moving through um, these other things. And if I knew how to bring this window to the front. That didn't happen. That didn't work, did it? Okay. Why don't I just tell you about it? <laughs> There's a diagnostic tool on, um, on the UC IPM website. And it's really easy to use. You start with the plant type that you're going to work with, uh, that you're concerned about. Then it gives you plant names. So if it's first you se select either a vegetable or a citrus or a tree or an ornamental, that big category. Then you select a plant name, then the plant part that's affected. And then and they've got pictures of all this and then the damage that you've identified. And from there, it comes up with all kinds of, uh, well, not all kinds of, uh, it narrows down the various possibilities of the pests that um, could be damaging your plant. Um, so it's a really helpful tool uh, to answer questions and it gives you a lot of descriptions about um, uh, whatever issues you might be having. Sharon, are you able to bring up the presentation? No. All we're seeing is just a blank screen at the moment. It's reloading. There we go. When I, yeah, when I go out, it, it turns off. So apologies for that. But um, if you get to this website and when you're home, you 
when you click on this link, when you, um, or just put the link in, I guess you're going to get a PDF. Um, you'll be able to bring up the website and uh, find that plant diagnostic tool. That would be really, hopefully really helpful to you. And again, we've got just lots and lots of information here, uh, places you can go to dig down more deeply. As well as remembering that you can um, always uh, uh, call the helpline. Call yeah. the, uh, and if for those of you who are not in our counties of San Mateo, San Francisco, there'll be a most likely in your county, a Master Garden, Gardener program. Just Google it and call the Master Gardener program in your county for the best advice that's particular to your local area. So we have time now for uh, questions. Okay, fantastic. So we've got uh, quite a few questions here. So let's go back and address them. Um, all right, so the first one is, this person's battling black and red beetles on their milk, milkweed, and they can't use neem oil because they know it affects the monarchs. So do you have any recommendations other than hand picking them? Um, what are the black and red beetles doing? Are, are they just like destroying the plant? Um, I'm assuming that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's probably the case. <laughs> So I guess how to get rid of them without using neem, alternative ways to get rid of it and not to hurt the monarchs that are feeding on it. Yeah. Eliana, do you want to take that one? I'll see, um, well, I, good question. I don't know. Um, I, <laughs> I wonder how badly they're competing for, for that plant. I mean, it may be that they may have to share. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's hard, it's hard to know if they're, um, if they're not affecting the larva itself and there's enough of the plant to share, um, that might not even be a problem. Um, and my favorite thing to do when I, don't have a specific solution. It is that uh, sharp spray of water, but if you've got larva on the plant, I, I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. If they are not on the plant and you just think that, uh, the, the, that they're destroying the food, uh, then I do that, pick them off or do a sharp, uh, a sharp uh, spray of water. Um, and uh, uh, again, you know, it, it maybe you could uh, take a picture so we know what kind of beetle we're talking about and um, send it into the helpline. Um, and they could maybe identify whether this is a real problem or not. Alrighty, that's fair. Um, let's move on to the insecticidal soaps. What are the drawbacks of using that? Some of them, I think, um, you don't want to use um, in the heat of the day because um, there are salts in them and you don't want, and, and the combination of sun and insecticidal soap might damage the uh, material, the plant material. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and making sure that the uh, concentration is correct. And that's the other, you know, aside from making sure to focus your, uh, a control on the actual pest that you're trying to get rid of is to make sure that the insecticidal soap um, concentration is correct. Oftentimes they sell it in concentrate and then you have to dilute it with water. Um, make sure to read the instructions. Oh, um, and I'll, I'll just uh, weigh in here too on the issue of insecticidal soap. Um, I've heard of people making homemade insecticidal soaps mm -hmm. uh, before. And um, some years ago, I did ask our, our um, uh, advisor, our UC science advisor, of whether that was safe or not and what the recipe is. And at the time, he said uh, there just hasn't been research done on it. Um, we very recently in our, our newsletter 
got a report out from various extension offices around the country about homemade insecticidal soaps. And I don't want to, won't go in depth um, with it, but the bottom line is kind of don't do it. Um, deter people use um, dishwasher detergent. Um, it, it's detergent, not soap. So it's not the same thing. And it's really difficult to formulate it where you're not gonna damage the, the um, plant with uh, too strong a soap. Mm -hmm. um, so there may, I mean, someday that may change. Somebody will come up with the right recipe, but um, most of the stuff you have in your house is not pure soap. Even ivory soap has changed its formulation. Um, so the, this outer gold goes into much more depth, chemical, you know, uh, depth. Um, so for the time being, it's probably best to get an approved um, insecticidal soap off the shelf that is approved for plants. All righty. Thank you. Um, so next question is, what's the best way to get rid of white flies? <sighs> well, <laughs> I, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, same old, same old. Um, yeah. Start with a sharp stream of water, underside of the leaves, um, but also do not expect that one time is going to work. And that's true with aphids too. I've, I, you know, told my friends or sisters to do it, and they can't believe that aphids are back. I mean, it's not. You're going to have to come out again because there's probably still eggs there that yeah. hatch again. But the population should be lower, and do it again. Do it a few times. Um, after a few days. And then insecticidal soap is, yeah. um, but you do, with insecticidal soap, you have to make contact with the insect. With the insect, but, right. Yeah, a general spray of the plant is not gonna reduce mm -hmm. them. They actually have to be um, coated uh, with, with the soap in order to uh, kill them. All righty, um, here's the next question. So how do you get rid of earwigs if they infest <laughs> your compost bin? I wouldn't. <laughs> well, the yeah. Earwig, yeah, earwigs, um, they're not that damaging. They're, they're do some good. They're decomposers. So they're in your compost bin. They're probably doing a really good job. And they're also uh, predaceous. They eat, well, aphids probably aren't gonna be in your compost bin. But um, boy, that's a place where they're not causing any trouble. So I yeah. leave them alone. Yep. Fair enough. All righty. Next question is, um, will hornworms stay on the tomato plant during the night? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, they will. I mean, I mean they'll, they'll stay on there as long as there's food to eat. And um, you know, unless something comes along and eats it. So, yeah. Okay. I'm I not hearing. Hear. I don't hear can. Yeah, I'm not hearing anything. Sorry. Oh, my fault. I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you hear my question there? No, no, we yeah. didn't. Uh oh, <laughs> okay. So there are small katydids eating holes in the leaves of the the herbs. Any way to control them? And K A T Y D I D S is the name of that. And I Googled that and it turns out to be bush crickets. They're like green grass yep. looking things. Mm -hmm. They have nice long legs. I've got them on, on some of my um, native plants. Um, you know, I let them be. I mean, they're, they're eating holes in, the, in, in my leaves, but not enough to make a difference. I don't know how much damage uh, that, that they actually do to herbs. Um, Sharon, do you have any suggestions? Uh, no, I mean, it, it, I think this is a question of, you know, how much you can tolerate and how bad the infestation is. And you could um, step up. I mean, you, you could 
consider um, some kind of pesticide. I don't, I don't know what is particular, yeah, right. if there is anything, uh, I'm not recommending it uh, for KVDids if you just can't tolerate it, but if you've got enough for your own use um, and uh, share. <laughs> All right. And I also know that for leafy greens and herbs, you sort of don't really want to spray because you're going to be consuming yeah. that, right? So That's right. That's uh, right. Sort of a predatory pest management may be the way, but I'm not sure what yeah. that would be. <laughs> for a Katie did, I, I don't know what that would be because they're yeah. fairly large critters. Yeah. Maybe birds, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Alrighty, so next question is, is it true that the leaf miner flies only lay eggs at nighttime? Wow, hmm. I'd never heard that. I haven't heard that either. Hmm. No, no. I don't know. But you could go to the uh, IPM website <laughs> and look up leaf miners, although I have looked up leaf miners and I didn't see anything I didn't see on anything that side about them yeah. laying at night. Um, so I would think if that was the only thing it would have been on that site because that might, you might be able then to cover up your plant or, or something like that just at night successfully. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, I would think it would have been published if that yeah. were the case. All righty. Okay. So the next one's about black flies. Um, they've tried, uh, they've considered, um, actually this is sort of a loaded question here, I guess black flies and aphids, they've uh, considered insecticidal approach or um, try to hose. So using a spray bottle with water to dislodge them um, and they can't really hand pick them. Um, they're asking if there are some flowers good for keeping aphids at bay, um, like marigolds. Um, they thought that were, they were good for keeping them away, but uh, I remember them disseminating the marigolds several years ago. So are there mm -hmm. any sort of companion plantings that can just kind of take all the insects away from your main plants? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I, I think I, I briefly touched on that in that um, that there are a lot of plants, including marigolds, and a lot of plants that have some repellent properties um, in a laboratory. They can t they can figure that out. You can go you can go online and you can see charts. Of, we didn't submit it here, um, but how many marigolds? How close does the marigold have to be? Um, or, or the, there's no, the research hasn't been done on it. Um, so there's no like real silver bullet in the repellent plant world that you can be sure. Um, another thing on that question I would address, a spray bottle of water is not what we're talking about to knock aphids off the plant or, or any insects. A sharp, I mean, a sharp stream of water, not so sharp that you're gonna break the plant. You know, you, you use the, under the leaves, a really, really, so that you really knock them out. A little, a little uh, spray bottle it is not going to do the job. And again, not not one time you come back and do it again for for aphids um, to control the population. Um, and then aphids, uh, you know, you can use insect. They're soft bodied, so you can use insecticidal soaps on them um, if if you if you feel you have to because it's such a persistent problem. And I don't know what the fly, what the black fly um, problem is. Is like a regular house fly, or what? Uh, what that is, and you know what damage it's doing. So if it is doing some kind of damage, you take a picture of that fly, and maybe, and send it in. Send a picture in to uh, your master gardener um, helpline. And they can maybe identify that fly and figure out whether it's a pest or not. It might not be a pest. That, and that's one thing I would like to suggest when you use the helpline, it really helps us if you take pictures of either the damage and or the bugs or the, or the pests that you are uh, trying to identify. Um, helps us when we do our research um, and we're answering the helpline uh, to get you an answer or give you information that will help you identify. 
already. So this is a really good question. Um, do you both know any of um, any pollinators that are active at night? Oh, um, the uh, well, hmm. Hmm. I was first thinking lacewing because I'm yeah. it's predator. Um, Moss. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, someone someone just uh, suggested moss <laughs> and bats. Yes. Yeah. Those are good pollinators. You're right. They are also pollinators. All righty. Great. Um, there was a slide regarding spiders and you had the second picture there was a black spider, I think, with white spots. Do you know what they're called? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. I probably did it one time, but I could, I could find out. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, I think we covered this earlier, but I'll ask it again. Um, insecticidal soaps and BT, do they hurt the predatory bugs as well as the non-predatory ones? Um, BT? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Sharon. Oh, um, the, uh, the insecticidal soaps only hurt the the bug it makes contact with so like the aphids or whatever it doesn't have much residual it doesn't last residually and then it does it doesn't hurt the the uh good bugs it doesn't hurt the uh natural enemies because it it only attacks specifically what it's in contact with and it's only soft bodied to uh insects and then you do you want to do the bt um eliana how that um, works what was it? Uh, the BT bacillus uh, theringiensis. That, that the short answer is no, but no, yeah. yeah. Go Can, ahead. Yeah, it only affects um, caterpillars. It doesn't even affect any of the other mm -hmm. insects. It works with uh, internally with their gut. What I'm trying. I, one time I knew specifically what it was that a caterpillar has that it interacts with. So it's not gonna even hurt anything that eats a dead caterpillar. It's not gonna affect at all any other insect other than the target insect, super selective. And it's, uh, you know, it's a bacteria that affects the gut, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and again, with the insecticidal soap, you wanna be sure that what you're, you're focusing your, your, your target um, spray on is the insects, the pests themselves. Um, because obviously, if it if it does, um, you know, get on the plant and cover the plant, or 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 gets on other things, it could be harmful for for other, um, you know, nearby. Um, and so you want to be sure that what you're doing is focusing your attack on the pests. Good point. Mm -hmm. That's right. Alrighty, thank you. So the Identify It app that you had mentioned, is that free for the public to use? Yes. Or is that a subscription based? Okay, no. it's free. Yes, okay. it's free. Great. All, all the resources from the um, UC ANR are free. They are, you know, kind of your tax dollars at work. This is what the researchers in the UC system, um, the science that they've come up with, and it's, it's there for the public. Got it. All righty. Um, moving on to the next question. Do ants do direct damage to the plants or is it just that they support aphids and other honeydew insects? In my garden, I haven't seen any um, effect of ants on the plants themselves. Um, no, I think they're, they're just there marching up and down the plant taking care of their aphids and, and protecting their honeydew. Um, so I would say no, that there's no- I, I, I agree with you, Eliana. I, I don't see damage. They're, they're, the problem with them is that they just attack beneficials right. who are trying to come after the honeydew producing insect and they protect them very effectively. There's some videos, I hope we put some links out that are just amazing to see what an ant can do to a beneficial mm -hmm. coming in to try to get to an aphid. Um, they're, they're pretty powerful. So then they just, they farm, they like farm the pests so, yeah. so that they yeah. can harvest the uh, honeydew yeah. from them. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, how do you get rid of squash borers? Squash borers. I'm assuming that's one I don't know. Bore into squashes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's supposed to probably beetle or you something. Know, yeah, it probably is. Um, and I don't have any um, experience with those. Um, Sharon, I don't know if you no, have any. No. Um, but I wish I was more facile. I'll have to figure out how I how um, I can flip to the UC IPM site because we would be able to go to that site and type in squash bar or type in squash and it'll all come up. It'll describe the pest, it'll describe the damage. Then you make sure you know what pest is actually doing the damage and what the treatments are. And um, Sometimes uh, insecticide is the only treatment, so you have to decide whether you want to go that route or not. But before you ever go that route, you really want to know what your pest is, and, and that really is the pest doing the damage, and it's not something else. Um, and uh, you know, make a decision about uh, about the treatment. All righty. Um, is there a specialized training or certification for IPM for those who might want to pursue this? Oh, I think there probably is. Eliana, do you know? I know I see stuff for professionals. On the line. There's definitely these classes that they give to also to all people who sell insecticides. Yeah. Um, no, but... Uh, you know, there's there's another class of certified master gardener um, <laughs> that's coming up if, if anyone's interested. And certainly there's information on our uh, website, on, on our master gardener website, um, which we refer to in the uh, presentation so you can get more information. When's our, our, our class, are we still open for applications for the Master Gardener program, the upcoming training? I think they're due tomorrow. I'm not sure. Uh, I think July 15th is, is the deadline. Yep. All righty, so here's another question. How do you get rid of spider mites without hurting um, praying mantises? <laughs> Wow. Do we have very many praying mantises in our area? I have not seen any praying mantises in our area. Um, we have quite yeah. a bit here in San Carlos, even oh, in the industrial, yeah. Oh, really? Praying mantises, yeah. They're kind of fun to watch. They, I'm, I'm sure they are, yeah. Yeah, they're kind um, of fun, aren't they? I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe one for the help desk. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not sure what the what the connection is to the particularly to the spider mites. I don't know mm -hmm. enough about praying mantises um, to give an opinion, but that's that's interesting. I'd like to know. Yeah. Hmm. All righty. What about how to get rid of stink bugs? Well. Stink bugs. Um, we do not have a lot of bad stink bugs here in California. Um, and I don't know if the questioner is from another part of the country where it's a big deal. Um, um, I was in New York, I have a son who lives in New York um, in uh, uh, March and you know we'd already done some work on this. And you know, we don't have like the brown marmorated stink bug much around here. They were in the house, they were everywhere. Um, it was even in their local news. Um, it's, it, it's a big problem. Um, and, and this is probably more detailed than, than everybody wants to know, but I even saw in the paper back there, they've got a, it's, it's an invasive, so they've got a native wasp they've been working on that controls the stink bug from I think the stink bugs from somewhere from Asia probably, and they're very hopeful that this is going to control the populations. But the problem with at least the brown marmorated stink bug is it's an invasive and it didn't have natural enemies here. So um, 
I think I think it's just a huge problem, and um, you, they also are about be careful to not um, hurt the spiny stink bug, you know, which is a predator when you're trying to get rid of the brown marmorated. Um, but again, didn't dwell, dwell, uh, dig really deep into that because at this point it's um, not a huge issue. Um, at least the brown marmorated uh, stink bug that really. Uh, uh, eviscerates some some gardens. Okay, alrighty. So, um, just one couple more questions here, and we'll wrap up. Um, is there something that can be soaked into the soil to deter ants without killing them? Just be off putting. Mm. I don't know anything I use, and then it does kill them, but um, you know, I use uh, taro and it's um, borax, which is uh, not harmful, as harmful mm -hmm. as other formulations. I only use the borax because it's, you know, would be considered safe in organic gardening and they eat the, the borax, they go back to their, um, mm -hmm to their colony and then they regurgitate, that's how they feed the, the, the colony is they regurgitate the food and has the borax in it. Um, if a little kid got hold of it, I mean, it's always encapsulated, but um, it wouldn't be problematic. I don't do any of the, any of the others, but it, yeah, it does kill the colony. I have, uh, boy, I haven't heard of anything that just uh, would throw them up. Yeah. Of course, cultural practices like not having, um, food sources uh, that have them go in. And we're talking about ants in the garden, not ants in your house. You know, ants in your house, you wanna make sure you don't have sweets and food sources for them so that they stay out in the yard. But I don't think other than they don't do that much damage, they aerate the soil uh, with, their, with their tunnels, um, that they do much damage to, to plants um, uh, other than that, that farming of pests farming of aphids and the like. Yeah. Alrighty. Okay, so last question here. Um, you know those electric fly catchers, are they pretty good or bad for the good predators? Mm. Yeah. You know, we even mentioned the lace wing is attracted to light yeah. um, and flies at night. So I think, you know, you're gonna be getting all kinds of good guys. Yeah, that's, that's the challenge, yeah. Alrighty, well, that will uh, do it for us today. Thank you so much to both of you and thank you everybody for attending and this was a fabulous class. Again, we'll go ahead and email out the slides and the class, recorded class here. And um, um, if Sharon and Elena, if you wanna share some closing thoughts. Um, be, the floor is all yours. Well, I want to. I want to thank. I know on behalf of Sharon and myself, I want to thank uh, Lingso for supporting Ma the UC Master Gardener program here in San Francisco and San Mateo counties. Um, you guys have always been just there supporting us and ha for having these presentations for us and and allowing us to share a little bit of information with the public um, that could help. Yeah, and I, I want to thank you, all you folks who, uh, who, who showed up today. Um, and I hope we could be of some help. I know we can't answer all questions um, by a long shot, but I hope we gave you some things to think about and some resources um, that will help you uh, make your good, healthy garden decisions. Um, so we appreciate you being here and, and thank you very much, Ken. Yes, thank you. Alrighty. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye.